Listen to part of a talk in a history class. People in the Revolution. Last class, we were talking about the timeline of the Mexican Revolution. Remember, we talked about how it had its beginnings in 1910, and that the real violence ended about 1920. So we are looking at about a 10-year-plus time period. Now, today, I want to discuss with you some of the people who were significant in the revolution. And I am not going to focus on military leaders and political figures. What I want to bring to your attention is the role of women in the revolution. At this time in Mexico's history, men and women were not considered equals. The men were dominant, and women were mainly involved in home, family, and the church. But women played key roles in the revolution in many ways. They were advocates for what they believed in. They were involved in politics, and they helped on the battlefields. Let's talk about the women who were involved in politics first. Mexico's class system did not deter women from being involved in politics. Women from both the high and low classes became involved and became prominent in politics. One of these women was Dolores Jimenez y Muro, D. O. Dolores Jimenez y Muro, Jimenez for short. Jimenez was a political writer and an important one. High-ranking revolutionary leaders listened to her ideas, and she was very well respected. She was a schoolteacher, and she was considered to be a radical. She helped form a plan that would provide for many reforms in the country that she believed would help the common people. She thought the people needed better working conditions, better wages, better education, and changes in working conditions and the length of working hours. She put some of her own ideas into the new government plan she was proposing. She suggested that schools be locally funded and controlled. She wanted each school to receive individual attention. She also wanted better housing for the lower classes, and wanted to have the government and landlords to charge lower classes less rent. She also wanted women to be included in any economic reforms the government instituted. Weren't women already in the workforce? Yes, but most women worked in less significant and perhaps, from a man's point of view, less respected jobs. For example, many women raised fruits and vegetables at home, and then took them to the village or town market to sell. Women were also street vendors and artisans. Now today, we know these types of jobs are important positions in many countries, and during the time of the Mexican Revolution, the jobs were also important, but the women were not paid well for doing these jobs. So, what Jimenez was trying to accomplish was to get higher pay for women. Correct, that was one of her goals, and it was part of her plan for reform. And if I didn't already mention it, she called her ideas for reform the plan. Now, I also want to talk about another woman who was an important political figure during this time period, and that was Hermila Galindo. Hermila Galindo. Was she a schoolteacher like Jimenez? No, she was a writer, and she was very young when the revolution began. In fact, she was only fifteen years old. But she was an excellent writer and was a feminist advocate. She became the editor of a feminist magazine and had excellent writing and public speaking skills. Carranza, one of the people we talked about yesterday, had Galindo give a welcoming speech because she supported his government. She was known for advocating equal rights for men and women, and she even went to the Constitutional Convention to argue that women should have the right to vote. Was she successful in getting voting rights for women? No, she wasn't. This was one of her unpopular ideas, and she had a lot of them. But when the idea of women's suffrage was not included in the Constitution, she threatened to run for a seat in the legislature. And well, the idea of women's suffrage continued to be argued after the revolution, and during the 1920s and 1930s, other women who were involved in politics used some of Galindo's ideas. So you are probably thinking, well, if she had so many unpopular ideas, why was she important to the revolution? Am I right? I can tell you she was important, and for this reason, even though she took some unpopular stands on topics. She addressed feminist problems, and had the courage to bring these problems to the attention of the people and the government. She demanded improvement in a lot of areas, and women who were active in the political scene years later continued Galindo's fight. 
Now, tomorrow we will talk about the role of women on the battlefield. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Number twelve. What is the talk mainly about? Number thirteen. Why does the professor mention Carranza? Number fourteen. What does the professor say about Jimenez? Number fifteen. According to the professor, what was Galindo's importance? Number sixteen. What does the professor say about the Mexican Revolution? Listen again to part of the talk, then answer the question. No, she wasn't. This was one of her unpopular ideas, and she had a lot of them. But when the idea of woman suffrage was not included in the Constitution, she threatened to run for a seat in the legislature. Number seventeen. What is the professor referring to? This was one of her unpopular ideas. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. Coral. Humans are destroying the foundation of marine life by their carelessness, their pollution, sewage, and through erosion. What is the foundation of marine life I am talking about? It is the living coral reef found in warm, clear, and shallow tropical waters throughout the world. Some coral is classified as hard coral, and some as soft coral. An example of hard coral is brain coral. The tiny animals living in colonies form coral reefs and are referred to as polyps. Polyps are usually carnivorous and feed on small particles which float on the water. The colonies they form can consist of thousands of polyps, and when the polyps die, they leave behind a very hard substance made of calcium carbonate. The substance is somewhat like limestone, so you know how hard it is. There is also soft coral. Soft coral does not build reefs. Sea fingers are examples of soft coral. Now let's take a look at the reefs these little animals build. Coral reefs are located all over the world. The largest reef in the world is the Great Barrier Reef, which is located off the northeast coast of Australia. The reef is the largest marine protected area in the world and is about 2,300 kilometers long and has a very complex ecosystem. Of course, fish live in and around coral reefs, but so does other marine life. For example, the Great Barrier Reef is in a protected area called the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area, and the entire ecosystem within this area is protected. There are several types of reefs. Reefs that grow on the ocean's continental shelf in shallow water are called fringe reefs. Barrier reefs are those that grow parallel to shorelines, but if they are far out into the waters, they are usually separated from shore by a deep lagoon. The word barrier means barricade or obstacle, and that is exactly what a barrier reef does. It blocks navigation and forms an obstacle which ships can't get around. Okay, I have mentioned fringe reefs and barrier reefs. Another kind of reef is the coral atoll. These reefs are interesting because they grow on top of old volcanoes which have sunk into the ocean. Usually, they start off as fringe reefs around a volcanic island. But then, as the volcano shrinks, the coral reef continues to grow and cover the volcano. Reefs have many functions. They feed and shelter fish, and they protect shorelines from erosion. Reefs also are land builders. They can form islands, and they can also change shorelines as well as protect them. Environmental conditions can adversely affect coral reefs. They are susceptible to disease, and they can be bleached. Bleaching occurs when the sea temperature is elevated. Sometimes bleaching is also caused by low salt content and pollution. If these harmful conditions continue long enough, then the coral can die. But if conditions are eliminated, then the coral can regain its color and survive.
Also, natural conditions such as hurricanes can damage coral reefs, and many problems are caused by humans. Humans are polluting waters, permitting sewage to ruin the reefs, and uncaring tourists who break off pieces and touch the coral as they snorkel or dive. There is one salvation, though: coral can be saved, and that can happen. Coral, when protected, can survive. Now, what has been done to protect coral reefs? Governments haven't been too successful in accomplishing very much in the way of saving and protecting reefs, but people have been. In some places, dive operators have worked together to keep boat anchors off the reefs, and in one area, the giant clam was put back into a dying reef area. And educational and research programs are being implemented in many parts of the world, and tourists are doing their part. Snorkelers and divers respect the reefs. They don't touch them, and they don't break off pieces to take home as souvenirs. So, when you read about wonderful vacation spots around the world that promote first-class reef diving and snorkeling, you are probably reading about places off the eastern coast of Africa or the southern coast of India, or the Red Sea, Australia, Polynesia, Florida, the Caribbean, and even Brazil and South America. As you hear about these wonderful reefs, think back to this class and remember one that little animals' skeletons have made these wonders of nature, two that they are being destroyed unnecessarily, and three that being more responsible citizens of the world can help them survive. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Number eighteen. What did the professor discuss about hard coral? Number nineteen. What does the professor say is damaging reefs? Number twenty. How does the professor describe the word polyp? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. There is one salvation, though: coral can be saved, and that can happen. Coral, when protected, can survive. Number twenty-one. What does the professor imply when she says this? And that can happen. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. So, when you read about wonderful vacation spots around the world that promote first-class reef diving and snorkeling, you are probably reading about places off the eastern coast of Africa or the southern coast of India, or the Red Sea, Australia, Polynesia, Florida, the Caribbean, and even Brazil and South America. Number twenty-two. What can be inferred about vacation spots? Number twenty-three. How does the professor introduce the lecture?